All right, we're all ready. I'm filling in. I'm the uh, pinch hitter today for the English Sunday School, and uh, we're going to be considering the subject of what uh, Baptists believe about church membership. And uh, so our text from the Bible is going to be in uh, Acts chapter 5, and uh, we're going to read verse 14 first. It says, And the believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. And then if you'll go down to the end of the chapter, verses 41 and 42. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were uh, counted worthy uh, to suffer shame for his name's sake, or for his name, and daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach uh, Jesus Christ. Actually, I think I might have wanted chapter 2 on that. The end yeah. of chapter 2? Yeah, verses, uh, chapter 2, verses uh, 40, uh, 46 and 47. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house to eat their meat with gladness, singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I, I think uh, most of us would agree that being a member of a Bible-believing New Testament church is one of the greatest things that's available to us. Mm -hmm. And it's great because it's a gift from God. And the Bible tells us uh, later in the book of Acts, in chapter 20, that the church is the institution for which the Lord Jesus purchased with his own blood. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the first church was empowered, according to the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost. It does not say it was established or born on that day. Hey, Chris, come on, run. Come on in. Uh, so um, it was empowered on that day. And uh, certainly, uh, for those who received the gospel and then were baptized and added to the church, it was a great thing because infallible scripture says that they had gladness. They rejoiced. They had gladness of heart, uh, singleness of heart. That means they were united in, in, uh, in their purpose. So today, I want to speak about the important subject of church membership. I imagine that not many people here, other than Kristen and uh, Jim, have heard a whole message before on church membership. Right. Uh, it probably gets discussed in other messages and maybe in discipleship classes and things like that. But, but uh, uh, today I'm going to speak on that. And uh, in, in, it should be, I think for most people, it should, should be an important subject to them. In my experience, there's really only four kinds of professing believers. There, there are those who know and understand the meaning, privileges, and responsibilities of church membership. And that's what every Christian should be, but not every Christian is. And then there are those who are church members, but they don't really understand why it's important. They, they, they don't consider the privileges and the responsibilities, and, and uh, they're just church members. And then third, there are those who are not members of any church. And uh, they maybe they bounce from church to church, maybe they go to church here sometime, and they go to church there sometime. But if you ask them, are you a member of any church, their response would be, no, I'm just a Christian. And then the fourth uh, kind uh, are those who are, who are actually opposed to church membership. And they think that uh, being a member of a church is not necessarily a good idea, or maybe that it's not for them. It's not for them. They're opposed to it. And uh, so they don't really uh, see any scriptural imperative or ne necessity in being a part of a church. But in order for any Christian to be blessed of God, they need to walk in obedience to the Word of God. <clears throat> Do you agree with that statement? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. if, if, God, if we're going to expect God to bless us, then, then we should be walking in agreement with what this book says. Now, there are plenty of, of professing Christians who knowingly disobey the Bible in some area of their life, and yet they suppose that God should still bless them, or at least not chasten them, because they are obedient in other areas. And so, they read their Bible, maybe on a daily basis, and they pray 
maybe three times a day before they eat every meal. And, um, and, but they don't really attend church, and they don't serve God, uh, the, and yet they, they feel, nevertheless, they feel fairly satisfied in their Christian life or their spiritual life. And, but I can promise you that anyone who does that, God is not satisfied with their spiritual life. And if we're disobedient to Him in any area, it affects our, it affects our fellowship with God. Mm -hmm. And so today I just want to uh, establish, first of all, a premise for church membership, and then uh, discuss for not very long at all the process of church membership, and then the preciousness of church membership, and I really don't know if we'll get to the purpose of church membership. <laughs> it, uh, it, in, in all likelihood, we're, we're, we're not really going to get there. So, But before we can discuss the biblical premise for or basis for church membership, we need to define church. Uh, because it's necessary. Because every one of us, we've heard about so many def differing definitions floating around out there. And so people will talk about the universal church. Or they'll talk about the visible church. And then some people will talk about the western church, or the eastern church, or the emerging church, or the Protestant church, or the Roman Catholic church. And all of those are very different institutions. They were founded at different times by different men. They have different doctrines. In some cases, they even have different Bibles. And so clearly, things that are different cannot be the same. That's right. So, so we, need to, we need to define church uh, according to the Word of God, and not according to the traditions of men, not according to uh, what, you know, uh, John Calvin or Martin Luther or Gregory the Great or anybody else uh, would do it. In the Bible, there's only one word, there's one Greek word in the New Testament that underlies the definition of the English word church, the Korean word kyohei. And so, uh, we, if you go to any, any Greek dictionary and you look up the word ekklesia, in a Greek dictionary, it has but one definition, a called out, constituted local assembly. That's it. And the Bible even provides us with an ecclesia that's not Christ's ecclesia. Uh, and uh, when there was the uproar in Ephesus, the Bible calls that, that used the word ecclesia in relation to that meeting in the temple when they were shouting for hours, great is the goddess Diana. That was an ecclesia. It was the ecclesia of Ephesus or the ecclesia for goddess, uh, the goddess Diana, but it isn't, it isn't Christ's ecclesia. It isn't his church. But only people who were citizens in, in, of the city of Ephesus were allowed to participate in that uproar, in that riot, and to go there and uh, be part of that. So the ancient Greeks, they, they did not have a, a strong federal government. They were just a collection of loose city-states, and uh, citizens of those people who lived there, they were required to be a member, to be a citizen. And if you were a member uh, or a citizen of that, of that particular city, when the local government called for an assembly, which is what ecclesia means, you were required to attend. And to not attend, if you, if you purposely chose not to attend, you might be put out of the city. You might be banished from the city and lose your citizenship. And so uh, that's how the Greeks understood the word ecclesia. When the Lord Jesus spoke in Matthew 16, 18, he distinguished his ecclesia from the ecclesia of the Greeks. And he said, I will build my church, my church. And so therefore, a New Testament church of Jesus Christ is a visible, local, autonomous assembly of scripturally baptized believers who are united together in the belief of what Christ has said and have covenanted to, to, together to do all that he's commanded. And so with that definition, 
in mind to help us see the premise for church membership, I want us just to consider a few things. First of all, a church that's set up by the Lord is better than a church with a human founder. Amen. I mean, I think we can all agree with that. A church that's set up by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, John Calvin built a church, the Reformed Church. Martin Luther built a church, the Lutheran Church. John Knox built a church, the Presbyterian Church. A lot of people think Calvin started the Presbyterian Church. John Knox started the Presbyterian Church. Uh, and at almost every denomination out there in Protestant Christianity has a human founder. Every one. Uh, the Charismatics can all be traced back to Kansas in about 1901. Uh, there's, there's uh, when the Nazarene churches were started and the Seventh day Adventist churches were started, there's a human founder for each and every one of them. And if you go to their own literature, don't take my word for it, if you go to their own literature, they're going to point to this person and say, He founded our church. But a church that was founded by the Lord Jesus Christ is better than a church that was founded by a man. There, there's never been anybody who said that someone other than Jesus Christ founded Baptist churches. Baptist churches have always existed. And churches that have had the, the doctrine that, 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 that we have as Baptist people that have always existed since the time of Christ. Now, second, a church that teaches truth is better than a church that teaches errors and unbiblical false doctrines. I think that we can agree with that. Sprinkling is an error because we can't find it in the Bible. A fusion, which is taking a cup and pouring a cup of water over somebody's head, is wrong because we don't find it in the Bible. The only kind of baptism that took place in the Bible was by immersion. Even John Calvin wrote that in his Institutes. You can, uh, I can show you in John Calvin's Institutes on the Christian Religion that he said the only baptism that the Bible knows is immersion. However, we don't have to keep that. God has given us license to to, to you know, baptize by other modes. Than, now, he can't point to a place in the Bible where God has given right. him permission to change what God has done. Uh, but nevertheless, a church that, that teaches the truth is better than a church that teaches error. Uh, an error, for example, that uh, uh, baptism or church membership or keeping communion can give you saving grace. Mm. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that those are things that uh, that are acts of obedience, but they're not they're not a means through of receiving saving grace. And there's so many different errors we could we could you know spend weeks talking about all the errors that exist in churches. Third, a church that teaches all truth is better than one that teaches only part truth. Only part truth. There are, there are things that you're just not going to find taught in most churches. In interdenominational churches or non-denominational churches, you are not going to find the doctrine of separation taught. But it's in the Bible, repeatedly. Almost every epistle in the New Testament has verses that teach the necessity of of separating from error and separating from uh, things that are contrary to what the Bible teaches. And, but you don't find separation taught in, in those, kind, uh, those kinds of churches. Uh, Christ taught in Matthew 18 that the final stages of discipline is to separate from an offending brother or sister and exclude them from the privileges of membership. If they refuse to repent of their sin, then they finally they have to be put out of the body, just as if we have cancer. We have to get that cancer out. We have to deal with it before it spreads. And so, uh, but you don't find that practice very often, even in Baptist churches. So, and then one more thing, fourth, a church whose only authority is the Word of God is better than a church that refuses to obey Christ's commands and takes 
for doctrines the commandments of men. And uh, these days virtually all Protestant denominations and even some Baptist churches, uh, they embrace things like women pastors. And yet the Bible says very clearly in more than one place that a pastor is to be the husband of one wife. And that it is not permitted for a woman to usurp authority over men in the church. People say, well, that's just antiquated, you know, uh, old-fashioned thinking. It's the Bible. It's the Bible. And uh, also, if you, you know, if you're divorced, you're not the husband of one wife. And uh, we don't, certainly we wouldn't exclude somebody in that situation from church membership. They're not a B membership either. I'll talk about that in a member. We don't have A members and B members. We don't have, you know, members who are up here and members who are down there. Uh, we don't have any nonsense like that. Uh, but, but, but for certain offices in the church, and only two, pastor and deacon, those are the requirements. Now, those aren't the only requirements. There's a lot of men who are standing behind pulpits uh, this uh, coming Sunday, or this Sunday, and they're not qualified to be a pastor, and they've never been divorced. That's got nothing to do with it. There's actually like 23 or 24 qualifications for a pastor. And it's a pretty tough list. <laughs> it's a pretty tough list. Yeah, and just one. If you, if you, if you are... If you have that mark on your name, and even one of them, then serve the Lord, but don't serve Him as a pastor. Yeah. So, uh, John Calvin in particular, he, he hated the doctrine of a saved church membership. Uh, uh, we, we can write the name uh, Baptist, B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S, -S, on here and show you the Baptist distinctives, but one of those two S's is a saved church membership. Baptists believe that you must be saved, to be a member of Christ's church. That seems rather self-explanatory, but John Calvin, he hated that idea. And in his book, Treaties Against Anabaptists, mm -hmm. um, uh, John Calvin wrote concerning the Baptist view of a saved, discipled membership. He said, in the early church, there were two heretical sects that caused grave trouble. One was called in the Greek, Cathari, that is to say, the pure, and the other sect was the Donatists, named after their first author and teacher. The Cathari and the Donatists were both Baptist groups. They were, they were Baptist people, just like us. These, whether of the first or second, <coughs> held the same fantasy as do these poor dreamers today, looking for a church in which one could find no fault. <laughs> no, no one ever said that. Uh, because as long as there are people in the church, it's going to have faults. Uh, but let, that's, there's a whole different thing between a man having faults and a man being saved. Right. So, uh, therefore, they separated themselves from all of Christianity. Not all of Christianity, just the ones who had unsaved members in their churches, <laughs> in order not to be in any way soiled by the imperfections of others. So, uh, John Calvin, he loved to set up straw men so he could knock them down. Right. Um, and he did that often with the, with the Baptist people. A lot of people who, who love John Calvin quote him. They've apparently never read his book, uh, his treatise against the Baptists. Uh, I have his book, <laughs> and I can, uh, I've got him outlined all of those places where he said that. And I, I've read him. So it, it would seem, though, that Calvin, uh, he cared little for Christ's instructions and uh, on discipline, or for the Bible's plain teaching about a saved church membership. And uh, most likely that's because John Calvin believed some very confused things about salvation. In, in some places, John Calvin was, salvation is by grace through faith. And no other way. But then in other places, in the same book, uh, John Calvin wrote this. He said, beside the teaching of Scripture is simple and clear. God has made our souls after His likeness, and they so indwell our bodies that when they depart from them, when the soul departs from the body, each goes to the place which it has prepared for itself by virtue of how it lived in this uh, world, some to consolation and rest, and others to anguish and torments. 
So John Calvin very clearly believed in work salvation. Wow. I mean, that's you couldn't you couldn't define work salvation any more clearly than what John Calvin did right there. That's his words, not mine. Uh, and I'm not I'm not summarizing or you know yeah. uh, that's his words. So if anyone believes Christianity is earned by the good merits, uh, the merits of their good works, as John Calvin. Uh, stated that he did in that passage, then denying the person, denying a person membership in a church is to deny them the opportunity to earn more good merit. If somebody thinks that they're saved by their good works and then you don't let them be a member of their church, you're preventing them from doing a good work, according to John, John Calvin. So obviously that's why Calvin was so adamantly opposed in his uh, Bible doctrine uh, of a saved church membership. So... Uh, that, that's that's our, the premise then of church membership. Well, we, we, we believe what we believe because that's what the Bible says. Yeah. And uh, so, now process of church membership. You're not going to be able to open up the Bible and find any instruction in how a person becomes a church member other than they were saved, and then they were baptized, and then they were added to the church. And it is always in that order. Nobody is ever added to the church and then saved and baptized. They are always saved first, always, without exception. Then they're baptized, then they're added to the church. And that's the only way that the Bible knows. So the process of church membership then would be to be saved, then it would be to be scripturally baptized, and then added to the church. But of course, uh, you can't, you know... Uh, be added to the church if you weren't in it, you know, unless you were not part of it to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't the salvation alone that adds somebody. And it isn't even salvation and baptism that adds somebody to the church. You have to be added to the church because you want to be added to the church. And uh, this is uh, something, frankly, that has uh, uh, caused a lot of people who attended this church for a while you know, uh, then they found out that in order to be a member, they need to come forward and be received into membership yeah. and receive the right hand of fellowship. And they're like, oh, I'm leaving and never come back. <laughs> Why is that so hard? Frankly, uh, when that happens, I, I don't go chasing after them. And, oh, listen, let me try to explain it to you in a better way, you know. Uh, because they probably would have just caused problems down the road, and you know it's it's best for them to go somebody go find a church whose doctrine agrees with them instead of the Bible, but they'll probably cause trouble there too. So, so uh, every church can do it a little bit differently. Some churches uh, require you to be interviewed by a deacon. Some churches require you to go through some series of discipleship classes. Uh, in this church. All that you need to do to be a member of Yongsan Baptist Church is have a testimony of having received Christ as your Lord and Savior, have a testimony of having been baptized by immersion. It doesn't necessarily have to be in our baptismal tank. It can be, you know, at another uh, church of light doctrine. Uh, now, if a Mormon baptized you because you wanted to do a Bible study with them or something, because that's what they do. They Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll baptize people. <laughs> it's just, just... To, you know, to have a Bible study with them, we're, that we're not taking their baptism, um, but but uh, and then and then come forward during an invitation time and express your 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 desire to unite with membership in the church, and that's that's all that is required. We don't we don't make you read the uh, church constitution and sign a document saying that you're in agreement with us or that you agree with every doctrine of our church, because because uh, you know. Most people don't know the doctrine very well. And uh, I don't want somebody to write, you know, to have to, maybe they disagree with some part of our doctrine. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, I'm all right with a church member having, maybe they don't believe in the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. Maybe they believe in a mid-tribulational rapture. If they want to believe that, that's their business. They may, they may not teach it here. They're not going to be allowed to teach 
their doctrine. If they if they start causing dissent by trying to you know get people to join their doctrine, then they're they're going to have to leave. Mm -hmm. But but uh, they're certainly welcome to be part of the church because you know uh, we all grow in grace. Mm -hmm. We should be anyways. And as we grow in grace, we might learn more and more about the Bible and uh, and then have our have our rough edges polished off. That's right. And and some of the things that that we believed simply because that's what we were taught when we were young. That's what we were taught in the first church we went to after we got, got saved. I have friends who got saved in Methodist churches. I worked with uh, Pastor David Young Janum at Seoul First Baptist Church for 13 years. We're still very close friends. Worked together with the Bible College Ministry, Bible Translation Project. He got saved in a Methodist church. Praise God, there are Methodist churches that are still preaching the gospel. Not so many, but... There used to be a lot of them, but not so many. There are Southern Baptist churches where the gospel, there are Presbyterian churches where the gospel is preached, and we don't deny. Hey, if they're preaching Christ, uh, you know, you're saved by the grace of God through faith in what Jesus Christ has done, then we rejoice in that. Uh, but what they teach about baptism is, you know, and church membership, that's, that's completely wrong. So um, uh, that's how we do it here. If somebody is saved and baptized, and then wants to become a men member, we will give them the right hand of fellowship and they become a member. And then that brings us real quickly to the preciousness of church membership, being a church. A member of a New Testament church affords privileges. The Bible teaches that there is an equality in membership. There's no second class church members. There's not A-list members. There's not uh, some that are sort of like, uh, you know, uh, sit, 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 sit in the back. You people need to sit in the back or up in the balcony. You know, <laughs> uh, we don't have any of that kind of stuff. So uh, God is certainly not satisfied with a church member, a church that prefers some members above others because God is no respecter of persons. And uh, so in those days, there were slaves. They said as much as 80% of the Roman Empire was slaves. That would mean, statistically then, it's likely that 80% of all of the apostolic churches, the members were slaves. But they had complete equality. Mm -hmm. That might mean there were deacons who were, who, who were slaves and slave owners who were not because perhaps they weren't qualified. Yeah. And so um, the, the Bible doesn't endorse slavery, but it was a fact of life then. And, and so uh, for them, church membership would have been a very precious thing. Very precious thing. And Galatians 3, 26 to 28 says, For ye are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, not by works as John Calvin taught, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. Ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And so when we have a business meeting and our members vote, the pastor's vote does not count for more than anyone else's, man or woman, rich or poor. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll just uh, go ahead and stop there, but uh, you maybe some other time we'll talk more about the preciousness of church membership as well as the purpose of church yeah. membership. And uh, let's pray that God will bless the rest of our church services today. Amen.